last night. Okay, good evening, everybody, and we're back again with our next recorded Skype talk. Um, as many of you will have hopefully seen, we have announced that the physical meetings unfortunately won't be back this year due to all the restrictions with COVID. So as it sits at the moment, we will be continuing with Skype talks for the foreseeable future. Hopefully, beginning of January 2021, we'll be back in the club. Um, but obviously, we'll keep people updated on that through our page. This evening, we're joined by one of our own committee. Um, Jennifer Barnes is going to be doing a talk for us, um, as you can see from the title on the screen there. Um, on the ethics of exotic, exotic animals for therapeutic benefit and mental health issues. Um, quite an interesting topic, hopefully this will be tonight. Um, without further ado, I shall now pass you over to Jen and we'll get underway. Thank you all. Thanks, Jen. You are welcome. So for those who don't happen to have the pleasure of knowing me, um, I'm Jen, as they introduced. I'm one of the committee members on uh, West Midlands Herpetological Society. I am also an exotic animal welfare consultant. Um, I passed my degree back in 2018 now um, in animal welfare and behaviour, and I'm just about to finish my master's in animal welfare science, ethics and law. So I'm getting there slowly as... Um, as horrible as it, as it is but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ethics tonight and I know that most of you uh, have just let out an audible groan because most people don't like ethics uh, and I wouldn't necessarily blame you it's a very difficult concept to get yourself immersed in completely um, the philosophical side of things in general is really difficult because it's um, ep epistemological. So it's the it's more about the knowledge of understandings more than anything. So usually um, it's split into into two epistemology and aesthetics. Um, but we won't get too much into that because it's a little bit confusing. But I did think that I should give you a background first, a little bit of a background with the ethics, because uh, it might make a little more sense the rest of the presentation that way, because I was asked um, to do this presentation specifically for uh, exotic animals uh, for therapeutic benefit, because um, it's mainly for people who do animal encounters. Uh, and a lot of the animal encounters uh, list therapy as one of their remits. So it's basically to cover the uh, ethics of not only um, using uh, exotic animals, but also for uh, the human side as well. So I'll start just with a, a really brief, it won't be too long, I promise. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, please do message me. Please do contact me at any point. Um, because ethics, it works better as a conversation. Uh, to teach it, it's dead boring. So um, don't feel like any question is too stupid because I will be absolutely happy to answer anything or to have a conversation, even if it's stuff that you don't, uh, you don't necessarily agree with, uh, with me on many points, which is completely fine. Um, but I'll, I'll start with the UK ethics. And we're a bit... We're a bit of an odd, an odd one um, in the UK. We are, as a fundamentally Christianity-based uh, nation, our ethics are based on Christianity and the Christian values. And um, whether you believe in Christianity or, or whatever your religious beliefs are or lack of religious beliefs, um, it doesn't really change the fact that, that that's what our morals are based on as, as our society. Um, and our relationship with animals and how we treat animals, uh, it literally comes down to this one paragraph uh, in Genesis 1.26. Um, and it basically relates to um, this having dominion over animals. So that's how people took how we get to treat animals, is that we have dominion over them. 
uh, and therefore we are number one forever and always and we're allowed to basically uh, do whatever we, we, we please with animals and you can see that that's happened uh, throughout history uh, in a brief timeline. Um, we eat animals, we use them for uh, medical purposes, we used to use them for cosmetics, we don't do that anymore but um, they, it all started from that um, and our legislation has been very poor with animal welfare, I have to say, um, for just over or just under just under a century. Got to get me maths right there. Um, so nearly a hundred years, we only had one one main piece of animal welfare legislation, which was the Protections of Animals Act, 1911, and that only got updated in 2006 with the Animal Welfare Act. So as you can see, that's a massive a massive gap, and in between that gap, we've had basically the birth of animal welfare and uh, animal ethics per se and um, definitely the birth of animal rights um that we know of today that came out in the 70s um so it's been a little bit of a mismatch in terms of legislation but our um we have different um philosophical viewpoints so you know you normally have your animal rights um which most people know what animal rights are you have utilitarianism uh, and you have virtue theory those are the kind of the three main uh, theories that we have in the uk and we mainly go on utilitarianism uh, which is a consequential um viewpoint and it basically uh, maximizes utility and minimizes suffering so what's you may have heard of it in terms of kind of like what what's the best outcome for the most amount of people um so utilitarianism really focuses on the consequences of an action um and that makes it different to animal rights which um kind of focuses on the action itself so even though we are a mainly utilitarianism based country um it, it doesn't actually show through very well in our animal welfare laws, which also includes contractarianism. It's another big word, I'm sorry. Um, but contractarianism is basically we can do what we want with animals because they can't basically agree for themselves. So there can't be, a, there's, a, there's basically a contract between us where we get to do what we want because they can't do anything about it per se. Uh, a lot of the times I, I, I see um, people mentioning animal welfare as a as an ethical viewpoint you may see it in animal welfare versus animal rights and even though animal welfare is kind of a viewpoint in america we don't actually have that viewpoint in england um it is utilitarianism that we use um animal welfare is uh it's actually something completely different um I don't think people use it in the correct context, but there's a lot of times where people say they're for animal welfare, not animal rights, when really what they're for is contractarianism, where they can basically do what they want with an animal and, and without consequence. So be careful when you're using terms like that, because it doesn't necessarily reflect the actual true viewpoint. Um, so I'm just going to go forward with the um, actual presentation and the whole thing is going to be reflective of utilitarian principles. So not even though it may sound sometimes that it's animal rights, it's it's not animal rights. None of this is animal rights. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions on that you, if anyone has any at any point. Hopefully you do. So <laughs> the main question is why, why do we actually have ethics? Um, and in terms with animal welfare, uh, it's, it's a multidisciplinary scientific field. Um, so the main components of animal welfare is the animal welfare science that you are able to measure. It's observable and it's repeatable. And then you have the animal ethics side, uh, which is reasonable logic. So it's the stuff that you can't do with science. It has to be a, a logical flow type argument. Uh, and even though it's so disheartening ethics in general, it really makes you question your own beliefs and it should and that's good and if you've ever uh, done something with owning animals say keeping reptiles in a certain condition if you ever get that feeling inside of something's just not quite right you feel a bit 
bad or guilty or something that's more of your ethical side coming through and uh, sometimes you have to really do have to trust it in the gut instincts department uh, to see whether um what whether you can justify basically your actions um so <laughs> this is going to be a, a difficult one for people to understand and i am really sorry um and this is why i am really open to, to having a discussion about this um but why we include ethics is because uh, we issue moral status to sentient animals and that may get the hackles up of some people of mentioning the words of moral status but moral status means uh, basically we issue duties to animals um, for the sake of of them basically so the way that we were taught how to think of it was um, if you uh, if you see somebody kicking a dog um, how would you feel about that person kicking a dog and do you think it's right or wrong now hopefully most people would say well I, I don't think it's right I don't think that's right at all and then you have to ask yourself why don't you think that it's right why is it wrong to kick this dog and I'm gonna hope most of you would probably say because it would hurt the animal and that is issuing it moral status so you are taking into accountability its own feelings and the fact that it can suffer so that's why we issue uh, moral status to, to to only sentient animals um but most animals now are considered sentient uh, everything including some vertebrates but but not all not most um but mammals birds reptiles all of those are considered uh, sentient creatures which means that they can suffer and experience pleasure and that's 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 all that that means it's nothing 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 major um, but it's very important in terms of law and uh, animal welfare of course because you can't really give something welfare if you don't if you don't assume that it can suffer at all um, so the way that we actually look at it is that uh, ethics forms the why part for animal welfare uh, and animal welfare science is important for the how so we can find out how to look after animals and how to make it better with science which is observable repeatable um, and then the why part is the justifications it includes ethics in that so the difficult part as, as most people would think so to start off the presentation um, I went with young people as a, a focal point just because it was uh, slightly easier to get statistics um, we know that there are especially recently with the uh, with the covid outbreak and social isolation with quarantine uh, mental health issues are quite rampant at the moment i know myself i was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and health anxiety I'm medicated for that and have been through some uh, therapy just to just to take that old edge off um so i can understand uh quite a few points of view when it comes to something like this there is um a lot of depression and anxiety that we get you see with within young people as well as the older generation i'm not discounting them um some shocking statistics is really that one in ten and these are actually old statistics so i i would imagine that uh it would be a lot more now but it used to be one in 10 young people having a mental health condition, um, which doesn't surprise me, I suppose. And it's not necessarily an issue that's just straight down to the UK either. Um, Denmark depression in 16 to 19 year olds had tripled uh, in 13 years, which is quite a small amount of time when you're thinking of scientific studies. And 17% of youth reporting good mental health in South America, that's quite low when you think overall. Um, I think I remember that study, the UK didn't actually come that much higher. And I think the top country was Japan for mental health. Um, but it, obviously it doesn't say why, so. But we know that it is a, a big issue with a, a lot of people. Um, and the problem comes as well with with how how it's been dealt with and um, there are a few things that um, are used to treat uh, depression and anxiety uh, antidepressants which is what i take i'm on uh, prozac um, cognitive behavioral therapy which again i dabbled in myself um didn't particularly work for me but some people have fantastic um outcomes with it 
a general counselling, which um, is said to, to you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that can help. Um, the problem is, is that with mental health conditions, they're very unique to individuals. So what works for some doesn't work for others. What works for, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it will work continuously. It may only work for a short amount of time and it'll have to change. Uh, and it also depends on on how the condition pro progresses or whether it, 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 it doesn't. So um, we, we know that um, what's mainly treated with antidepressants, uh, it doesn't have the same effect for everyone. And so it's not necessarily the, one of the best ways to treat um, any kind of mental health condition, but, but really does work with some people like myself. Um, I can't. I can't uh, recommend mine enough, really, for that. Um, but I know that, obviously, when it comes to different therapies, there is the um, animal-assisted therapy side, um, what we actually call animal-assisted activities with therapeutic benefits, because you're not actually allowed to call it a therapy um, due to there being no real scientific definition. In, in that terms, it's a bit of a dodgy a dodgy one. So if we look, most people will know um, the animal assisted therapies comes with domestic animals. So you see the kind of pack dogs um, that help with kids with reading and education and just general well-being when they bring the dogs around. Um, animal assisted uh sorry, emotional service animals as well, they can be considered. Um, but there's a huge recent influx in the use of exotics um, for animal assisted therapies. Uh, there's not a huge amount of statistics on it, mainly because um, it's quite new still. But I know that since I've been doing this for 12 years now, um, that it has massively uh, increased. We still don't know. Um, how many companies are offering this service because we don't know how many companies are actually out there at the moment in the UK. Um, I'm actually doing my master's dissertation on finding out how many animal encounter companies there are in the UK to be able to get a definitive number on there. Um, but as of yet, we're not entirely sure. The last figures were from 2013 and there was about 180 companies. So that's still quite quite a considerable amount of companies, but expect that to be at least double, to be honest. Uh, and they all use um, exotics for their therapeutic uh, benefits, what they can offer for um, clients. I did find one study of the NHS actually using snakes uh, in therapy for uh, depressed teenagers, and that actually went down really well. It was quite a cute little story. Um, and um, it did quite well as far as if I can remember. I do have the links on the back of this that people can check it off. Angel the corn snake it was uh, used for. It was it was quite a nice little thing. Um, as we know, if you go with um, animal encounter companies, therapeutic benefits, if anybody's ever used them before, it's usually that the, uh, the encounter company will come to your house uh, and, and they'll carry out the, um, the company, the encounter there or sometimes you can actually go to one of their bases uh, that they have uh, it's not usually usually they do come to you so it does actually offer a bit more of a personal one-to-one um, -one kind of basis um, rather than say group therapy uh, but the price ranges are a little bit uh, on the more expensive side than conventional therapy. Um, I did try and get a price range from about 150 to 200 per hour. That will change with different companies. I've, I've got no no issues in, in some that are charging less and some that will charge more. It just depends. They are businesses. So either way. And a big part and a very interesting part actually of this was actually why people use exotics. So I set about some research uh, in terms of scientific research as well as asking people in general who have had uh, exotics over for therapeutic benefits and a lot of um, people mentioned that they had allergies, fur allergies towards domestic animals. So um, cats and dogs and uh, even though there's a rat in this picture here, class as a domestic, um, the fur allergies put them off from having 
therapy with with the more well-known species like dogs and cats um there are religious exclusions from certain domestic animals like dogs or people have fears um of dogs and cats but not necessarily of um snakes or or any of the exotic mammals and people um, are more inclined to get involved with exotic animals as there's a natural curiosity so people are, are more likely to be drawn towards things that they've never seen before or they've never been a part of before and we've all been there when we've you know we've seen an animal that we've never seen before and it's absolutely fascinating and it just adds that little bit extra uh, of of engage, engaging the client uh, to help and um it i can't say anything wrong with that um a lot of well not a lot some some companies who don't own exo um don't own domestics or they do own domestic species but they say that they're unusable um so obviously training takes a, a long time um with the therapy dogs um so it is not necessarily can be a straightforward process there's a lot of things that can go wrong and so they don't use their own domestics but they'll happily use their exotics who they feel are a little bit more well behaved um and this is actually a, a fantastic point in 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 a lot of it is that uh, many people and many of the the people that i asked um they found that exotics were were more for them, especially the disliked animals like snakes and reptiles, because they themselves feel like they're disliked. So there's more of a um, a connection and a relatability to the animal rather than a fluffy dog uh, or a fluffy cat. You know, things that people usually love. They'd rather have the nice smooth snake or something that people is usually afraid of. And apparently, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing if this is incorrect with a lot of them, it was it was more appealing to male patients um, to have what they would believe a more manly animal. And I'm saying that in, in air quotation marks because it's but that, that was one of the one of the, the reasons. And a, a big point in the use of exotics is to actually see whether it works and this is a really uh, another really interesting um topic and it's a topic in itself because when you actually go through the research and and there is not particularly a lot of research even for domestic animals it is very positive and negative that it doesn't particularly lean one way of working or not working there are some that some that swear by it some that say no actually it, it did nothing so there is no quick and fast answer to whether it works in general but as you know as said before mental health conditions are very individual so the differences will is down to, to the individuals really of how well it works personally I know from myself that it does you know I've had positive um positive responses from using um exotics in animal therapy for myself as well as uh, other clients and I know a lot of my friends and a lot of people in the exotics world really do um, dote on their exotic animals and they've basically saved them. And I know a lot of people will feel exactly very, very, very passionate about uh, the keeping of exotics and just how well that, you know, th these, these animals have impacted their life positively and give them a reason to be and to wake up and to carry on doing things. And we can't take that away from somebody regardless of what the scientific evidence says. So. Um, I've got no issues in people holding on to that. If, if that's what they truly believe, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that because I, I've seen I've seen the good. I've seen bad, but I've, I've seen mainly good uh, in, 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 with the scientific evidence and the anecdotal evidence is what we call it. But if we go through, obviously, just a bit of the research, um, of, the USA is way ahead in terms of um, studies with the use of animal assisted therapies and animal assisted activities. It is not very prevalent in the UK at all. Um, we are so far behind uh, on, on tapping into something that could actually be fantastic. Um, but that's that won't be down to us. That'll be down to companies and whether they're willing to actually put the money into the research. 
and there is what the few that few studies that, that do exist um it was mainly on birds uh used in perceived mental well-being studies so that's basically where um, they ask the person questions about their own uh, mental health and how they perceive it and whether it got better or worse whilst owning a bird and apparently it lowered perceived depression there are many many reasons for that it doesn't necessarily mean that it was the bird but um, it was one of the reasons uh, if I won't spend too much on the scientific research again it's, it's just a little bit boring and it is very much uh, a to and fro it, there was no solid evidence for either in either way um, so we'll say that some more scientific research is absolutely needed for, for, for the benefits and for any possible negatives that could come out of it. And these are just a couple of the anecdotal evidence um, that I could collect um, with exotics. And there's in the corner um, Angel the Snake, who's happily uh, treating in part of um, a a depression therapy group um i'm not too sure whether they're still going um because that was in 2009 um but we you know they could have got better they could have they could have had more exotics you never know and if reading through these there's some fantastic ones and there was a lot of really good uh, anecdotal evidence for using exotics and there's also um a couple of negative ones um, with the respondents, and I, I can kind of understand this one for, for certain, that um, just just looking after exotic animals and the welfare aspects of keeping exotic animals had a negative impact on mental health because they do require so much more care. And and to be fair, as we all know, being in, in the exotics hobby is actually quite exhausting at the best of times. And then taking care of um, a lot of animals on, on top of that, it, sometimes it can have the opposite effect and, and, and decrease mental health. And finally, to get well, to get into the, the ethical and welfare considerations, I thought I'd go with the human side first, the anthropocentric side, um, just to get it out of the way. And this is where ethics really does come into um, looking into things events like this with with animal encounters and we are not it's not about being negative it's not about being against um animal encounters at all but the whole point of ethics and then welfare is it really has to scrutinize um the the event that's going on dealing with animals that's the whole job of what it's supposed to do so even though this may you know some of it may sound negative um it is just the reality of of the activity that's that's carrying on and and the ethical implications have to be noted so that we can have the best animal welfare especially dealing with um exotics uh and people obviously with 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 people um luckily i say luckily we have recently had a, a law update for the animal activities license 2018 uh, before that, the only thing that was available was the Performing Animals Act of 1925. Uh, the Performing Animals Act came out at that time to basically cover circuses. And I don't know whether you've ever seen these people, but there's usually people down at the beach who have some random random exotic animals, say like a uh, marmoset, or I've personally seen tarsiers, I don't know why, and um, an eye eye once. And it was basically to control people like that. The Animal um, Performing Animals Act wasn't, it was a register, so all you did was, you know, ring up your, your local council, um, you paid the fee, and you basically got put on a register, so it wasn't a license in itself. And even though there were animal welfare kind of provisions to it, they were very, very weak. Um, it did not give much power to the local authority uh, to be able to do anything if there were animal welfare concerns. And it just in general, it, were, it was a very... It, it, oh, I'm trying to think of, 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 of how to put it without... It wasn't enforced very well. 
and that's nothing i'm not saying anything bad about the encounter companies but we basically had to rely on the animal encounter companies to um kind of look after themselves and thankfully most have done a, a fantastic job some not so much but but most have done a fantastic job um and so thankfully that did change yeah. And now we are under the animal activities license. Um, there is a lot more animal welfare provisions. There is a lot more enforcement to it. And there's a lot more um, powers that the local authorities can hold to be able to change things. I have yet to decide whether that is actually a good thing. Um, animal welfare departments of local authorities don't usually exist. Um, it's usually the uh, environmental health officer that gets lumbered with the animal welfare jobs. Um, and recent statistics is that 70, I think it was over 70, maybe 71% of local authorities just pass all of their animal welfare concerns onto the RSPCA for them to deal with. So they're relying on a charity to basically do their job because the Animal Welfare Act, which is the underpinning act that, that um, that act encompasses all other animal related acts. Um, it is a criminal act and it needs to be policed by the proper authorities, which would be actually be the police. But they, they're not really that keen and they're not, um, they don't have the budget for a start and they don't have the training, uh, which again hasn't changed with the upgrading of the laws. But we can always be hopeful for a better future. Um, I'm happy to to train any any authority or anyone who wants to learn any different um, I suppose it's just putting myself out there and then willing to trust me to be able to to train Jen can I jump in for there for a sec yeah sorry sorry um I know what you're on about with the you know the local councils and some of them aren't the greatest um but then that ne doesn't that need to filter through down to your everyday keeper as well because what it's governing at the moment are basically only shops and shops give out really good advice and give out everything and their shop is to a standard that the guidance stipulates but then it doesn't filter through it does it doesn't but um the uh People animal do what encounters they want Animal encounters have their own guidance. They're separate to shops and from hobby under the license. So general keepers aren't licensed at all unless you have DWA animals. So they don't they don't necessarily have to apply to any of the guidance for shops or for animal encounter companies or animal exhibition count, uh, companies. Uh, they just have to basically adhere to Section 9 of the Animal Welfare Act of however they feel necessary to to um, understand that. So the problem is that when, you, when, when we have a law um, or regulations, they need to be enforced. Uh, a law is only as good as its enforcement. So they've introduced all these fantastic, uh, well, I say all, I think there's been about three or four new animal welfare legislation, which is well overdue. But uh, I don't want to say that it's a facade um, because they have actually put a little bit of effort into it. But personally, I don't think that they've, really listen to the um, concerns that people had in terms of enforcement because it can be the most fantastic law on paper but if nobody's going to enforce it there's no point and animal welfare can be reported by anyone so I could take you to court uh, for an animal welfare offence or any member of the public can take any other member of public um, to court for an animal welfare offence up to three years after the event has happened um, so it's it's the problem is that it has to go through some sort of legal aspect through the police and the CPS. The CPS aren't likely uh, really to convict people uh, or to agree to put the case forward to the courts um, due to evidence usually, and the courts are 
have their hands tied with how much of a sentence they can actually give. Now, it has recently gone up to five years, but you probably won't see that um, being issued very lightly. And there are many, many cases. Usually when we talk about animal welfare, we're not on about cats and dogs, but we're talking about animal slaughter. So in slaughterhouses. Um, there was well over, it was either 70 or 80%, I'll have to find the statistics on that, um, where there was animal welfare um, breaches and nothing happened. Uh, so the main, that's basically where they're focusing all their efforts is with animal slaughter. Obviously, we slaughter billions of animals a year. And that's where most of the animal welfare issues are. So they put their efforts into that side and they kind of forget about other sides. That was one um, thing I was going to, you know, you said about the um, the prosecution and it's five years and not very easy. It's not going to be given out lightly. No, I don't think it will, no. When, when you see people are given animal bans and, you, you know, you only ever see, see the worst cases online. I'm sure there's going to be more cases out there than, than what you see. But how when they're given a ban from keeping animals... Who then regulates that? I mean, I've seen it in the reptile hobby several times that so such and such person has been given a ban from keeping animals due to keeping them in this condition or that condition or whatever, and all they've had is a ban for a life, lifetime ban. What stops them, in reality, going down to their local pet shop? Or nothing. Buying an animal and taking it home. Well, the, 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 the police would be enforcing the ban... But the problem with that is they'd have to require a, a warrant to be able to search the property to, to unless it stipulates in the bank conditions, I think. Uh, but usually it would require a warrant, which takes a while to get. Uh, it's not something that's, you know, sometimes it can take a couple of hours. But in that time, what's to stop Bob, who's banned from animals and his collection of 20 royal pythons? What, what's to stop him from just taking the animals and storing them next door? In that meantime, while they're getting the um, while they're getting the warrant, nothing. <laughs> this is the problem with with animal laws. is It's not the laws itself; it's the enforcement of the laws. Um, they, it's just like an afterthought to uh, government. Not to sound too mean, I'm just saying, in my opinion, it's a bit of an afterthought. So, so nothing. It, it, it's it's yeah. size more so than anything else. It's it's basically um, a show off is is what it is it's the same as um the recent ban on um wild animals and traveling circuses 2019 that ban was always to be in place um since the license came out in 2012 there was always going to be a ban um but the lovely michael gove uh decided to put that forward as a kind of new thing and look what he's doing and the, the ban finally went forward um, and, you know, he's the first person to, to be able to ban the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Now, um, there were two circuses in the UK that had wild animals, uh, which amounted to, I think, 48 animals. So they've banned 48 animals, basically. It's a, it was a, a really use, useless law. Uh, that was brought in for nothing other than bravado of look what i've done aren't i fantastic um in reality it made no no difference really to animal welfare so i know a lot of people would support the ban of uh, wild animals and traveling circuses but really it would have been better to focus efforts on other larger animal welfare issues say um well, the biggest one, obviously, being animal agriculture, where billions of animals suffer a year. You know, that would have that would have actually been helpful for animal welfare. But no, instead they went for um, they went for circuses so with the two circuses that are in the UK. Wow, uh, okay. I'm not at all a bit about that. At I'm going to put I my just... head 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 on neck on the line a little bit here. I've got to be honest. Go on. But. I think the banning of circuses is rather pointless when you just said, was there 180 encounter companies, which will that, probably double? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, this is exactly, exactly, um, they're exactly the same. Yeah. Less, Someone could argue with less. that comment, but they are yeah. more or less the same. 
No, no, I'm I'm fine to put uh, I'm fine to actually put my head on the on the neck in this one. Um, and I'm not even giving head my head on the neck. Uh, my What's my neck on the line for this one, or my head on my neck. Either way, um, and that's what part of my that's basically what my dissertation on is actually looking on uh, whether welfare has improved in banning the use of wild animals and circuses, considering that there is a very uh, a second more easily obtainable license which is the um animal exhibitions license um it's cheaper and there are far less animal welfare provisions so with the circuses uh, act i'll just call it the circuses act um they had to have three inspections from defra one of those to be unannounced with defra appointed vets they also had to have their animals checked four times a year by a head vet they had to have a head vet um, and there would have been other informal inspections that happened along the way. Uh, with the animal activities license, you don't have that. There are, um, I think, the beginning inspection when you have the license and then when your license is renewed. And if your local authority decide, you know, I'm not, you know, they'll give you a three year license, then it doesn't get inspected for three years. Whereas with the DEFRA um, circus license, that was a yearly license. It had to be updated every year so they had to go through the same thing at great cost themselves um it wasn't the cost of defra at all they had to pay for everything so for those 40 42 animals um the welfare provisions in the the circuses law was actually a lot in my opinion a lot higher than the animal activities license that we have now which they're happily able to join and still take the same wild animals um around the country because the definition of circus is very very vague so so it, it, to go off on a little um tangent there i think is the word uh, so thank you matt I, this is what i really appreciate is the questions being asked so I, I'm, I'm able to go off on little rants because i love me little rants but if i can go back as, as as other in it has changed a little bit now with the animal activities license before um obviously people required no qualifications uh, to be able to get the animal register, animal performance register. Now, um, I think that they ask that you do hold at least the level three in a relevant, um, a relevant subject, an so animal related subject, a level three. Um, not, I'm not going to push down obviously a level three. I think it's a fantastic qualification for people to uh, obtain. Um, I don't personally think that it's the be all and end all. I think they should have either pushed for a higher qualification or not at all. Um, in in when it comes down to qualifications, but a lot of people have qualifications in 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 a relevant subject anyway, or some of their trainers do. So that's that's neither a here nor there. But obviously, before then, um, there was only one company that held the level three in animal assisted therapy specifically from the British Yoga Society. Uh, again, I can't. I can't dis discredit that qualification because I, I've never seen it um, and I'm not sure how much of an accredited company the British Yoga Society is. So um, I just put that on there as a, as a point of interest. At least this one company's tried. So fair play to the company. They will obviously all have to have DBS checks usually uh, to work with vulnerable people. And what we have to remember is these people are working with vulnerable people. So um, adults with disabilities, um, young children with disabilities, young children in general, um, these will all be considered uh, as vulnerable. So usually have a lot, a lot higher um, checks in place. One of the biggest issues that I have is that there are no accrediting bodies in uh, for animal um, encounter companies. So um, you have uh, accrediting companies for the use of normal domestic animals, but not for exotics. And it is possible um, that they can be a part of the um, domestic, so SCAS, um, and they can use their guidelines for sure, but it doesn't it doesn't kind of equate a lot of the times as it's ISCAS is mainly with dogs and horses, which are completely different animals. Uh, so it would have actually been nice to have a regulating or accrediting body, just something extra uh, to give people peace of mind and to train 
the animal encounter companies as well uh, just uh, just a little bit more say how we have like biaza and iaza for zoos which is an accrediting body um it just gives people that little bit more you know a little bit of peace of mind and it's just better you know it's better for companies as well to actually have a accredited body to be able to push themselves forward in the in the trade that they have something that other people don't um again this is one that i'm really sorry is going to annoy a few people especially with the mention of that name warwick um i say it warwick specifically i know it's warwick but it's warwick uh it's i'm sorry it was actually it was an it was an okay article um i don't necessarily agree with his quote uh the greatest potential threat to human health resides with the trade in and keeping of exotic animals uh, exotic pets um i know that that is a bit uh weird as well with, with the recent effects of covid and um a potential of where that came from it, which is only a potential it's not it's not a definite um and there are many uh, i think there are uh, more than again 70 percent or 60 percent at least i keep saying 70 or 60 and i'm sure it's that um diseases in the world are zoonotic so so most conditions are zoonotic anyway um because that's the way that 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 they work that they're able to cross a species barrier we're very lucky that coronavirus at the moment hasn't crossed again to a species barrier because that would probably mean the end of us um it's been it's been good so far fingers crossed i've jinxed it now i'm really sorry if i have uh, so i don't agree with with warwick in in in, in that at all um and with the article, uh, again, one of the science things that you can do with articles is look at the credibility of an article. So who the authors are and who those authors work for. And considering they all work for the animal, uh, well, all all of those authors work for the Animal Protection Agency. And um, Clifford Warwick has set up his own Emergent Disease Foundation, that it can be a very biased article. And I'm not saying to, dis to completely disregard it, because you can pick actually some really good science from it. So it gives you a list of all of the conditions and the potential effects of those conditions. We are all aware of keeping animals, and this is any animal, um, domestics and exotics, that there are potentials for zoonotic diseases. Salmonella is a big one um not so much in reptiles um as it's a different species of salmonella um it's not a warm-blooded species of salmonella so there's less likely of a transmission um but they can also pass on the uh, salmonella intrica rather than salmonella bongori which is the, the the latin names of both those sorry um pinworms as well general hemolymphs um we all love a good parasitic worm well i do I don't know about you um so they are a potential issue as well but to be fair you mainly get those from dogs now um i know as a kid i was always coming down with worms because i was constantly playing with the dogs now i'm quite old so this was back in the day when um shall we say animal welfare and, and the regular worming of animals was not necessarily top priority and i am talking about three or i was about three um, and I've never had any kind of uh, infection or disease so far, so far from any of the exotics that I've been in contact with. And I have been in contact with some very dodgy exotics uh, and I've managed to be fine. I do get the occasional infection off my cat with cat scratch disease. Um, but that's that's neither here nor there. Never from an exotic so far. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Uh, and I don't think I know anyone who's actually transmitted um an infection from uh, an exotic uh, i'll have to ask i can put that forward to anyone that's listening now uh has anybody had any kind of infection from i say that there's only like three people who's listening to me right now so um matt or beck or mike uh may know a bit more more people than i do but i don't think that i can't remember of ever knowing anyone i've never known anyone no I, I don't i know that there was um a study that was put out and um people were i think they were asked 
or they were they were given a reward or something for fulfilling in a survey of whether they've actually ever had an infection from a an exotic and they had no replies that they'd had so and that was sent to quite quite a number of people uh, but we do know that it does happen in young children uh say for like with turtles and putting turtles in their mouths uh, and catching infections from that and I don't particularly feel that the animal should be blamed in that circumstance. If you're going to stick something in your mouth, uh, you're going to expect diseases from it, okay? <laughs> and that goes for everything, okay, guys? You need to be safe. Matt, yeah, Jen, if I, Jen, if I can just jump in there, I'm not sure whether this is coming across, to be fair. But, I mean, with regard to um, diseases and transmission, particularly with turtles, yeah, um, my my own background. I started with a turtle and terrapin rescue, um, and we were dealing with hundreds and of various sort of different sizes of red-eared sliders and all sorts of things like that, in in terrible conditions. And, yeah. and personally, I've never ever had an issue with anything. And and overall, I mean, I've been working with with exotics and and reptiles, especially um, for. Over the years, and and never, never had. No, I've, I've, as I say, I've, I've done a lot of. I've never really heard it, or or if or if I have, I've heard of one case of a young child. Uh, she was about four, catching a case of salmonella from a hedgehog, from a pet hedgehog. But in no. all fairness, I don't think that they were able to kind of directly blame the hedgehog because they had other pets as well so they had cats so it it's a difficult one and and it's not one that personally i don't think that somebody unless they only had one animal um say a, a terrapin and they put it in their mouth and they got salmonella bongori then yeah okay um but if they had salmonella entrica i don't think that you could really you know say for definite that it was the turtle but i know that they did change the law and in america that they can't sell turtles under two inches so that kids stop putting them in their mouths i mean you could always teach a kid not to put things in their mouths that's also a really um a good way of of you know stopping the spread of disease one, one thing i was going to say Jim, is when they blame the animals for that i don't think you can blame the animals for, for any of it in all honesty in that sort of thing because if you're going to kiss a turtle a snake a gecko or you're going to lick it you're going to kiss it you're going to put it in your mouth and suck it whatever you wish to do even with just, the animal. even just touching even just touching is a risk you know personal hygiene comes into it though as well doesn't exactly it? You yeah it does the animal for lack of personal hygiene no no and uh, in fact if you if, i suppose if you look at other animals as well um sean just brought up a, a good point about um aspergillosis with birds where you get it with parrots and you get it with chickens uh, and that can pass on as well so um even though uh clifford focuses on exotics considering the exotics it, even though they're still in the top 10 of, of pets in the UK, um, they are actually decreasing in popularity if you go by the Pet Food Manufacturer Association statistics, which is probably the most accurate statistics in terms of statistics, uh, well, statistical analysis anyway. Um, dogs, cats, horses, you know, chickens, fish, they're all still quite up the top, rabbits, and, you, you know, you, people still contract a hell of a lot of... Um, well, not hell of a lot, but that's where majority of the uh, zoonotic infections come from. That, and I think the biggest one is actually eating meat. So obviously um, we, we will encounter uh, diseases, uh, Campylobacter, Salmonella, uh, my favourite, which is um, threadworms in pork. I love that. Um it all comes from the animals that we eat. And to be honest, if you're in an animal, you, you, you have to kind of expect that there are going to be levels of, of, of parasites on, on um, what is essentially dead flesh. So, But you stroke any kind of animal, you put your hand anywhere, it makes no difference. As long as your personal hygiene is kept up to date and, and, and well, you're not really more at risk uh, with animal infections than pretty much any other infection per se. 
Um, but when we are talking of exotics with vulnerable people, um, obviously these people, uh, the clients, are likely to be immunocompromised. So they have um, a lesser effective immune system than a normal healthy adult. And that really does actually need to be taken in consideration because they're more likely to catch the infections and more likely to suffer a greater illness from the infections. So the hygiene really does have to be ramped up. I have to say that in, in, in I'd say 99.7% of all encounters that I've seen, and I've seen quite a few, um, the alcohol gel is always av available, which is a part, obviously a part of the regulations now, um, but it was before. Uh, people were asked to wash their hands. You weren't allowed to eat near the animals. So usually, you, well, it is pretty good with animal encounter companies. Every, anything can be better, and I'm usually a stickler for um, really uh, ramping up the hygiene. But I am from a science background anyway, so I'm used to that kind of um, those regulations. So I can come in and add more, whether people do it or not is, is down to them. But it is definitely something that we do need to think of when we're talking about immunocompromised people. So it's just people, you know, keep, keep an eye on, on things like that. It's, even if you're immunocompromised and you own reptiles, you know yourself, or young people, babies, you just have to keep your hygiene up and there's usually no problem. Um, one of the issues as well in a consideration is and this doesn't happen often and i don't want you to think that it does happen often but it is a point in some cases where um parents or clients themselves uh have been convinced not convinced but not by the company anyway but by their experiences to stop conventional medication in favor of uh just dealing with the animal assisted therapy without seeking medical uh, advice which is obviously not recommended at all it is never recommended that you stop any kind of medical intervention without the advice of your medical practitioner. And you can't uh, can't blame people if they're you know if they're seeing a good effect from the weekly sessions with animal assisted therapy over the horrible side effects of their medication. I can understand where they come from because all they're trying to do is 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 get the best out of their their life basically, but it's not something that should be done and people should not be asking their animal encounter companies for any kind of medical or ther therapy advice basically you need to speak to a qualified practitioner for that and of course it is expensive for continued use that's down to the you know individual encounter companies uh, i know that a lot of companies agree on a, a, a massively reduced price if people book a few sessions um, so it doesn't necessarily become too expensive. Uh, there's a lot of places that do um, volunteering as well, um, especially for uh, children with behavioural issues in school. I myself have been a, a part of a few programmes when I worked in a private facility, a private zoo, um, and they used to have the behavioural students come along. If they'd behaved that week in school, they got to come to the centre and help out with the animal care and the cleaning. And they were always the most loveliest kids. Um, and it was a shame how uh, basically the, the school system kind of fails them uh, in that sense educationally, um, because we, we, they were perfectly fine with us. They loved the animals. They loved coming to see the animals. Um, so we never really knew the behavioural issues of certain kids or, or why they said they were because they were fine with us. But it, it happens in different settings. So, it, yeah. And I'll Jen, get on. Yeah. Um, for, uh, Becky's just messaged me and said her mic doesn't appear to be working. Um, oh. But she has asked me to say, Ask your question. Do the regulations have any consideration for zoonotic illnesses transmitted from humans to animals as well as the other way around? Yes, they do. They do. It's not it's not in depth, but they do have some considerations. Um, and it depends on what regulations she means. If she means animal um, animal encounter companies, then yes. Um, I think there might, I think there is some with the, um, 
pet shop licensing as well mike if you can confirm that i think there is i'm pretty sure i saw some things in there to do with uh, zoonotic diseases and there definitely is with the uh, zoo licensing uh for sure i i know that for sure um so yes kind of um but it, it's not necessarily in depth but it's not supposed to be anyway so um the welfare considerations to do with animals Again, this is not meant to sound, it does sound a bit negative, and I promise you, I only mean it in the best of intentions for animal welfare, not for animal rights or any other, any other purpose in that sense. Um, but there are um, ethical considerations or concerns using non-domesticated animals um, in terms of their behaviour. You can, they're not domesticated, um, as the name so obviously suggests mm -hmm. and therefore you can tame them and they can tame down really well but they will never truly be domesticated and so never truly being domesticated means they don't really have any desire for for human interaction and I say that with the best of intentions because I know loads of exotics that I've had myself my skunk even though they're considered semi-domesticated um, would always come for human interaction and so would a lot of uh, reptiles in certain cases iguanas have been shown to come for human interaction um, so I do mean that with the good intentions but we do have to, to take that as in consideration that they aren't domestic and they're not really they're not they don't really care about being handled unless it's negative um, there is a possibility of using wild caught reptiles and mammals it is much less rare with mammals but it does happen i have seen it happen um i had the lovely um intent well, of seeing kind of like how mammals are transported to the uk for um from europe and beyond um in fact, probably the less I say about that, the better, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely um, a risk involved. Uh, there's also a higher risk of zoonotic transmission with wild caught reptiles and mammals. And inverts, of course, as most invertebrates are wild caught. Um, apart from tarantulas, usually they're quite well captive bred. Um, there may be an encouraged desire to keep exotic animals. Personally, I've seen this myself on certain encounters um, that people see, say, like meerkats or raccoons or skunks and go, that, that's fantastic. I want one of those. And majority, obviously, of the, um, of the I'll say, the good encounter companies, you know, they're not there to sell animals. They're not there to, to portray these animals as good pets it just happens to come across because there's a nice animal in front of them so they um they won't usually give them any other information on where they can obtain uh, an exotic animal and they will they will usually give them the bad sides to keep in exotics i will give animal encounter companies that they can be incredibly responsible there's quite a few i know of that w will purposely not put down an animal but give the the truths about um exotics so that people aren't misconstrued with how much of a fantastic pet they can be but it can encourage the desire when people see oh that's a nice meerkat i want one if they can have one then obviously they're available and i can have one um another consideration is that it is a considered exploitation of animals for monetary gain and i'm i know that sounds bad uh, i'm sorry to anyone that again it gets their hackles up it's not meant to but it is by very definition exploitation of animals um because it's 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 using a natural resource uh, for money and i'm not saying that people you know are earning a hell of a lot of money from it although some people do um but it makes no difference it's still considered exploitation it's the same as selling animals for pets it's just a, a consideration that we have to put in there Obviously, welfare, you know, this, this probably should have been number one, to be honest, um, on my list. Um, but usually I, I crack on so much about animal welfare. It bores me sometimes. 
Um, but the, obviously it is different to domestics. Uh, exotic welfare is more specialised. They have different temperature requirements, different lighting requirements, um, taking animals out for, uh, as a second point, in extended periods of time. Uh, if you're thinking of snakes that get taken out in robs for a large amount of time, over four hours with no heat, no water, no shelter, um, they all present uh, welfare concerns. Uh, Any time that an animal can't exhibit natural telos, so natural species-specific behaviours, it's considered a, a welfare concern. Uh, uh, some some people are better at uh, providing natural for their natural behaviours whilst they're out. I know that um, the new regulations put a lot about their natural behaviours in. Um, so that they have to provide kind of shelter uh, and appropriate food as well whilst they're out, uh, access to water. But um, as you can see in this picture, I can't remember where this was taken actually, um, but they drill holes in the side and the animal's just in there and you come along and they take the lid off and you see it, it gets handled for numerous amount of, you know, let's say 30 minutes, it gets put back and then it gets taken out again within the next 20 minutes. The animals aren't given time to calm down. There's nowhere for them to go. They can't hide. Um, so they're basically building their uh, stress levels inside and there's no way for them to bring their stress levels down. So it starts to become, because um, we have different kinds of, uh, so, we have different kinds of stress. Um, there's chronic stress, and then there is de-stress, which distress is considered short-term, uh, usually from handling or something. And then the animal is given time for the stress levels to come down. So it gets put back into its enclosure. It can go and hide and calm down. Whereas chronic stress is where it's not given or not given ample enough chance to be able to do that. So for somebody who's taken a, a large snake out, because large snakes are pretty cool to show off, they really are, and they do draw in a crowd, and you can do a lot of educational um, work in in telling people about snakes and why you shouldn't kill them, etc., etc. But they've taken that snake out for eight hours that day. It's the only big snake that they've got. They go home on the night. Um, you know, that animal's been traveling for, say, two hours and been out for eight hours. And then it gets taken out the next day. It's not given that animal an ample time to be able to calm down. And really, um, just as a general, I'm not saying that there's a huge amount of scientific evidence to this, but personally, I would leave it a week between taking every animal. Understandably, that's not um, really... Um, possible for some businesses especially smaller ones if they don't have that many animals um, but my my job isn't really to think about the business but to think about the animals even though I do have to take the you know the, the businesses into consideration of course um, so that was um, one of one probably one of my biggest issues is the fact that the animals aren't given ample time to rest even when they're out um, animals should have 30 minutes out and then put away for a couple of hours and then rotated really uh, a lot of companies do do that um, but a lot of companies don't they just kind of shovel their animals out on a table and it's kind of like a pick and choose and there you go sort of scenario uh, another issue uh, this has happened quite a few times um, that I've seen personally as well, that because the exotics aren't really predisposed to want human interaction, especially snakes, um, rejection can upset clients. So when you're dealing with a vulnerable adult um, and all they want to do is hold this animal, love this animal because, you know, this is the fantastic thing and that animal decides to bite them or not decides but feels it has no other option but to bite or wants to run away and um, it can cause mechanical injury to both the animal and to the client. They end up getting scratches or bites or uh, it can severely upset the client because they've been rejected. Um, and it can obviously severely upset the animal as well, cause more more issues, more likely to, to, to bite as a defence um, or just to completely not want to be taken out at all. And Another issue being separation of group animals. This is one that you will see a lot, uh, especially in meerkats. Meerkats are a mob animal by nature. They should be kept in groups um, for their best 
behavioural um, welfare for that. They are, a, a, as they're a group animal, a lot of people take out one meerkat or maybe two. Um, but with the one meerkat, when you take it out of um, a mob, there is a chance that that mob will then kick that animal out when it comes back because it will smell different it'll be different it hasn't been there for a while uh, and it can upset mob balance very easily um it's i say i know that animal welfare has got a lot better recently in terms of with um mob animals like meerkats and people are starting to actually keep them in more than pairs but there are still a lot of people who keep them in pairs um so when you take one um, and leave one behind, it just completely separates the mob entirely and it can cause aggression between the animals as well. And if any of the animals at the time have got uh, young babies, um, it can increase aggression towards uh, youngsters as well. So that's something that people need to really keep in mind when they're taking um, group animals by singles. If I can actually move move forward on to to a, to a bit of con, of a conclusion, I know I've rabbited on a bit um, because ethics is a really long subject. And again, I'm more than happy to speak to anyone about w with this for hours if they if they really if they really wish. And I do feel bad that um, no, I, I don't feel bad. It's my job. It's my job to kind of give you the the pros and the cons and i know that there are a lot of cons but that's just the reality of keeping animals unfortunately it will be the same with domestics as well as it is with exotics there's just a little bit of a difference obviously with with the type of animals but overall i do believe there is a lot more research that is needed on the subject in terms of animal welfare and for uh, the use of therapy because you know we have seen some really good positive things and it would be a shame that that this isn't offered uh, to a lot more people when it can can have much of a more of a beneficial impact than traditional methods whatever they may be um, but as there's no real mass financial gain to be had from using animals uh, over say pharmaceuticals then it, it's not likely to actually get the the research that it that it, it just you know it does actually deserve to get um, I still believe strict uh, regulation is required um, more towards vulnerable adults personally, um, but also towards animal welfare. And that's just to ensure that they're as safe as possible. Um, I would actually be fine to have that as, as an, accrediting body, uh, an accrediting body as well. So if anybody fancies setting up an accrediting body, that would be that would just be grand. That would be fantastic. Um, a good one will be an introduction of an accredited qualification as well. That's going to help people understand others' needs a lot better, as well as animal welfare. Uh, that will maximise the efficiency of the treatment as well, so um, better overall for humans. And increasing animal welfare is obviously going to be better for the animals that are used. But overall, um, as I've said before, numerous times actually, um, I don't actually see a reason why uh, the use of exotics can't be used, in, especially in conjunction with controversial, uh, controversial, uh, conventional treatment um, for therapeutic benefits. And I keep saying therapeutic benefits as opposed to therapy because um, uh, it doesn't necessarily meet the definitions of therapy so therapy has to be goal orientated and it has to be um kind of looked over by a professional uh, whereas animal assisted therapy is is actually just a, an animal assisted interaction so there is no goal there isn't usually a, it's not goal driven it's usually just a, a one-off visit of to make somebody feel better at that time sort of thing and that's why it's not considered therapy even though a lot of uh, companies put therapy in their um in their remits And this is the most important part, of course. If you do ever require anything to do with ethics, animal ethics in particular, I could try other ethics. Um, I can't say that I'd be very good at it, but I could definitely try. Even if you 
fancy just having a scream at me even though I'd rather you didn't scream at me because I cry easily but if you do then please do contact me it's what I'm here for I've spent so much money on qualifications and I really want to use them well so you'd be doing me a favor as well as learning something I've put my contact details here um, I haven't put my mobile number on specifically because I don't really want people having my mobile number but if anyone does need it I would probably give it if you if, if you required it I'll still be a part of the um, committee for the West Midlands group so you'll see me next year at meets as well or you're more than welcome to contact me on Facebook in the meantime or to have any kind of even put the comments or questions underneath um, on this presentation when it does go out um, I'm I can do pretty much any animal ethics that people I would like to do something um, with animal rights because I know a lot of animal rights gets quite the, the negative um, press um, in our hobby and some of it is well deserved but a lot of it is misunderstood so I'd be happy to talk about the differences between animal welfare, well, I say animal welfare, between utilitarianism or increasing animal welfare uh, as opposed to animal rights because uh, it's one that people often get confused with that I've noticed anyway. Uh, so do feel free at any point just to just to give me a chat. I'll be happy to help. But other than that, that's pretty much it. I do have a question for you, Jen. Shoot. So there's a lot on Facebook. Um, with people comparing uh, the, the husbandry of reptiles, more so in this country to the American community, which is greatly different. And then people trying to educate people through, uh, and I will quote, morals and ethics. Um, aren't they subjective to your own beliefs? Mm, kind of a no. Um Ethics is the term implied basically to society. Morals are uh, more of a subjective view, but you can't really... Um, your morals and your ethics kind of will, will align. Uh, so you, you can't... The, the problem with philosophy, the problem with ethics is regardless of what situation you take, you have to be consistent. Um, ethics requires consistency so you can't be and i'm just using this for instance against using animals for entertainment and then morally find it perfectly fine to hire an animal encounter company because that's a contradiction between and a lot of ethics do contradict because a lot of people don't know their own ethics yet uh, and that's absolutely fine i'm not saying that there, there's um that there's anything wrong with that and sometimes your your morals and your ethics change as you get older or you know when your priorities change um mine definitely have uh doing the uh, masters um i've de i've definitely become a lot harder um a lot more perseverance i'm not going to say towards animal rights um because a lot of again a lot of people don't understand that so i don't want to be confused with being an anti when i'm not um, but I have more of an understanding of animal rights now. Uh, I'm still utilitarian, as far as I'm concerned, a preference utilitarian. Um, so I'm fine to be able to, to keep animals as long as they have a fantastic life in captivity or equal as good as they would in the wild. Um, but we, um, I say our morals and our ethics in general aren't necessarily that different to um america's it should kind of be the same but we are far advanced in animal welfare than they are and i'm sorry to say there are some fantastic organizations in the usa and i'm not saying that it, you know the whole place is terrible but in, especially in terms of legislation um we are far ad more advanced than 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 america so far in that aspect um so you will see great differences between them both and by all means if you want to try and um push for better welfare with with people who you see aren't doing the best then then you can that's absolutely fine um 
the good thing with um, ethical viewpoint, it will differ, obviously, depending culturally, uh, religiously. You are allowed to question other people's um, ethics as long as you do it respectfully. So no one can stop you from, from uh, say, questioning their ethics. I, I see a lot, say, with... Um, eating different kinds of animals i'll just give it as you know, like a random example and people say oh you know certain certain cultures shouldn't eat dog for example um and even though on one half of the argument people say well we can't really question them it's a completely different um it's a different culture and we should be respectful of that and then on the other side they're saying well you know dogs aren't for eating they're we have certain animals that we and it's halfway kind of right in between both of those we, we do have the right to question we can't really question the species of animal in that sense of you know even though we have a relationship with dogs we have a relationship with cows as well in terms of domestication we still eat those um so you can respectfully question things um i don't know whether many people are actually good at respectfully questioning so and we have to be mindful of uh, the part in the world in which you've grown up in because your, well, that, that's part your, of the, yeah. your thoughts vary from, you know, if you're born in East Asia, Southeast Asia, um, and regions like that, what's on the menu is a lot different to what yeah. you receive over here in the UK. It, it, abso it absolutely is. Um but for the for the but for the majority of it as well, it's exactly the same. Um, I, I know a lot of people seem to attack the uh, Asian uh, community for eating different animals. But uh, I'm just giving the example of say the Yulin Dog Festival. M majority of people in Asia disagree with this practice. It's it's not a so you know a completely socially acceptable thing across the entire of. Uh, of Asia so there is a lot of prejudice that people and sometimes just downright racism um, that people put forward um, when they don't understand a situation at all there'll be many different uh, things that, that influence this if you're in an area and all there is is a certain animal that's where you get your protein from then that's where they get their protein from it is different um, but the reason why we we can't say um well we we can't say well we can't question anything is because again you know like with i says that ethics has to be consistent um we in certain other cultures again have to be really careful with saying this but certain other cultures um uh, if they uh, say some of them don't agree with um homosexuality and they're liable to uh imprisonment kill, or worse yeah imprisonment or kill someone specifically because they're gay um then we, we should be able to question that uh because it's in the advancement of of human rights and a quality of life so if you're questioning something for the better in to advance either human or animal welfare or or rights if, if people are, are for animal rights uh, as long as they do it respectfully, then that should be absolutely fine. Um, Are the two comparable? Human and animal rights? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, would Googled, I Googled that question. Apparently it was something you don't ask somebody on a morals and ethics basis. So I thought it'd be a good one to throw in. No, I, I think the, the, to go into it, you have to kind of gather what, um, your um, ethical viewpoint is. Um, I'll, I'll use utilitarianism and animal rights because they're the two largest ones people usually fall somewhere in between those two or at those two um and when we i say we as the human race not just like me and some dude in a shed um when we were looking basically what what gives us the standing to have rights why should we be good to each other why shouldn't we murder each other? Why shouldn't we do certain things to other humans? Um, there has to be a crossover with animals because there's not much 
difference in terms of the ethical justification between animals and humans so i'm not punching sean in the face right now because i know that it'll hurt sean uh and it's the same reason why i don't punch my cat in the face because i know it'll hurt my cat so uh, there is no real difference between non-human animals and humans in that sense when it comes to issuing them uh, their moral status and why if that well, makes on the, sense. on the same basis of that you don't eat people well i mean some cultures do <laughs> uh, <laughs> usually with philosophy we find murder ick is what they know it as murder is gross it's disgusting we know that um if we die what we will be missing we won't you know we can't enjoy life anymore because we're dead but not only that the only real difference with human and animals is basically who's left behind so if you killed me um i should hope that sean would be very sad i should hope that my parents would be sad you know we can't say anything for definite but I'm sure they would be very sad and it would have an impact on their overall quality of life. Um, not so much for me. I'll be dead. I'll be gone. I'll be feeding the worms or whatever they decide to do with my body. But it abruptly ends my life and I cannot know. I can, can no longer have enjoyment. I can no longer suffer as well, but I can no longer have enjoyment. When we kill animals, uh, even say for meat, the concept is kind of the same. We are taking away their ability to be able to enjoy anything. We can also take their ability to suffer away, but they can no longer enjoy. But nobody's going to grieve for them when they're gone. So that's why we kind of issue less of a moral status uh, or less of a moral responsibility to animals than we do for humans. But the moral responsibility is still a lot greater than what people assume. So the, the two aren't comparable in that aspect? Um, they are comparable, but if uh, comparable, comparable, but if I look at it from the surface, um, I would probably say no, because you have a different reaction, uh, a different Im immediate emotional reaction reaction from a human dying than you do from an animal dying. But we quantify our responsibilities to each other based on how close we are to each other. That's just human nature. It's what we do. It's called the socio-zoological scale. So we issue moral status um, to those who are more closely like us. So we have the great apes, for example, chimpanzees, um, gorillas, uh, others in that area, cetaceans, dolphins, uh, and killer whales, elephants, um, we give those the, the most out of all of the animals because they're the most like us. Then it's just general mammals, then it's in general birds, then it's in general, um, I think it's reptiles, then fish, then invertebrates, or it might be fish and then, in, then reptiles. I'm not, no, I'm pretty sure it's reptiles, then fish. Um, so the, the, the further away the phylogenetic scale you get, the less light we have in common with something, the less light we are to give it um, uh, moral status, which is why everywhere, even in the West, is so um, late at affording reptiles any kind of welfare protection, because we've not long only just realised that actually they can suffer. Um, so that's why it's it's taken so long but the only thing that buggers that up then is obviously domestic animals with dogs because we can put our dog before our neighbor do you know what i mean like it's not even with humans we kind of have the same like my mom dying the effect on me it will be greater than hearing the about somebody from china's mom's dying even though, you know, it's still a loss of a human, it's not the same reaction because that person's not as close to us or not close at all, even though we can still feel sadness for it. So it's just, it's a long, complicated conversation, if you know what I mean. That's fair enough. I just thought I'd try and throw out some extra questions towards do. the... Do, uh... absolutely do. 
Any, any you can think of. Anything well, I was going to say, do, do Mike and Jen, uh, Mike and Jen, Mike and um, Beck. Becky, sorry, Rebecca, have any questions? I think they're asleep. Nope, Mike's here. The, the only thing I was going to ask, which um, was raised earlier on, was regard to um, private prosecutions as such. Is it feasible to bring a private prosecution under the DWA Act for somebody keeping illegally, for example? Um, um, you know, no, no. Because the problem with that act is to do with the actual owning of the animals rather than an animal welfare issue. Right. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can, but uh, it's unlikely to go... Uh, we both know from experience that it doesn't really go anywhere. The, the, uh, the DWI system. And I mean, yeah. we've all spoken with regards to the DWI licensing situation um, and the issues surrounding it. Um, unfortunately, with the the councils and the the regulatory bodies, they they seem to have their hands tied um, and don't seem to be able to actually achieve the the results that we'd like to see yeah yeah which is enforcement of the law even just slightly exactly. um that's that's as i says that's that's one of the biggest issues is the enforcement is just nearly non-existent uh, it's so poor and even though we are one of the best countries for animal welfare on paper in enactment you know we win we, we're, we're nowhere near at the top because it's just so lax it's unbelievable uh, and you can get away with so much. Um, and even if I give, I don't know many prosecutions of animal welfare. Um, I've actually asked before um, about how many prosecutions there's been for life feeding, for example. Uh, and it's so, so minuscule. You're talking on one hand. Uh, and it was so little that not even the RSPCA could give me an answer. And they are usually the ones that bring forward um, the prosecution to court because they have the money to do so so if you have the money and the evidence to do so then go ahead but i don't think you'll get very far in all honesty you sometimes think that some of these laws legislations have been brought in to uh, appease the animal yeah, rights groups yeah, yeah yeah absolutely of course 100 percent. yeah no doubt in my mind as i says that um the uh wild animal and travel and circuses bans uh, 2019 that was just for appeasement of people and for animal i wouldn't even say animal rights because if you ask in general i suppose it can go either way um it, during the welsh assembly there was actually a really good point brought up by um rona that um you know in one one you know the circus not day but for the time that they were at, they had 80,000 people come and buy a ticket. That's a lot of people. So surely if you're buying a ticket to uh, a circus that has animals, you're kind of agreeing with their ethos with using the animals for entertainment. But um, one of the a big issue that happens in scientific um, research as well, specifically actually, um, and just in general, is that when somebody with a specific bias um, wants to ask public opinion, they use the internet as a um, a large. Um, it's a place where you can get the most kind of replies rather than standing on the streets talking to the actual general public but the problem with that is people on your facebook or on your twitter or online uh, you usually have people that are like yourself that usually have the same kind of um ideals and ethics as you do so um 
say, for example, when um, APA or any of the animal rights or even the RSPCA in certain put forward a, a public opinion post, um, they share it within their own groups. And then the uh, people who have the same, say, animal rights, uh, the same viewpoint, they'll share it amongst their own groups with their, amongst their own people. And that skews the results because you've basically got a thousand people who have the same kind of um, ethical viewpoint whereas if you were doing it on the streets with random strangers you'd get a lot more of um, a lot more of a, uh, a difference in opinions but and it's exactly the same for people who put forward uh, any kind of opinion pieces with exotics if you're doing it in your own on your own Facebook you have to take into consideration that the people that you ask are people who are likely to have the same opinions as you so it's it's bias from the start and you, that's something that, that must be taken into consideration in anything. Uh, do the government do that? You know, mm, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes they do. They have um, specific groups for this sort of thing. And anyone who's in science um, will, will have that into consideration because they know it's a confounding variable. Um, but I don't particularly care much for public opinion. Um, research in general specifically because of that issue it comes down to the should somebody so did you was more going i was, I was just going to say i mean on, on that point i mean obviously um at one point in the presentation there you referenced a paper by a certain mr warwick um notoriously anti-exotic there you go uh, to the bottom there a review of captive animal linked zoonosis in the Journal of Environmental Health Research. Yeah, I mean, un unfortunately, Clifford is is renowned for being um, completely anti animal keeping. Um, does that give that particular paper any less weight? Uh, um, does it depend on who's actually? Well. Yeah. The thing is, with a lot of Clifford's work, um, when researching it, as I did before, a lot of his journal articles are opinion pieces in journals, and opinion pieces aren't uh, peer-reviewed. Um, it's just something that you can put forward. So even though it comes up and it's referenced as an article, it's actually just an opinion piece. Uh, and the articles that are referenced, they do go through peer review, so they are kind of at the standards they're at the standards of you know from anyone else because we can say exactly the same thing about anyone who's for the keeping of animals so this is what i don't want people to do is to instantly dismiss anything that comes from warwick because you can go through his papers as i've done and you can pull some really good science what comes with the science then is crap opinion um but the science itself is is pretty good um especially some of his behavioral work i will have to give him that yeah, but i'm no. more like i i'm more like warwick than i do elaine toland One, um, i don't really rate her work at all um but as i said we can we can do exactly the same with any other kind of um researcher any other kind of author who's already in the exotics or works for an exotic vet for example and you can't dismiss their work because they work for an exotic vet so you can't dismiss his work because he works for aunties take it into consideration for definite but don't dismiss it obviously one one of the issues with Clifford is is his his background as an animal importer isn't always necessarily um, made aware to people who are following his his information. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> that. Michael, I, un I understand that. that. But to be honest, I would come from the same place. Um, I have definitely changed my opinions from the start of my journey in exotics to where I am now, uh, and. Definitely, definitely, probably for the worst, to be honest, um, because just the amount of stuff that I've seen for myself and scientifically that can be backed up, you know. So 
on on the one side you can actually look at it as okay well he knows all the bad that goes on and that's why he changed his mind so he actually has more anecdotal referencing towards it than somebody else you can't dismiss him because he worked for um or he was an importer because people are allowed to change their their ethics they're allowed to change them their opinions on anything and he probably did it because of the all the stuff that he saw so we we can't use that against them to be honest well whilst i would agree that people are actually able to change unfortunately um clifford and his information that he tends to put out is very very dated and he's not he, he's basing opinions on things which happen it is and it's it is and it's half of it's dated because there just hasn't been any more research and half but, of it's dated because he's too lazy to update it himself and and also it doesn't crazy. fit in with his own you know there will always be it doesn't matter what your opinion is whenever you write an article you will always have bias always uh, and, and the whole point of figures actually helps with his bias doesn't it what say that again sorry using old and potentially outdated figures actually helps with his bias it can do but um again we we could do the same thing with the old figures i know that with the um i followed back there is a, a reference that you always see and you always see it in articles you always see it in books and you always see it in the animal rights thing that 70 75 percent of reptiles die within the first year of ownership now i checked that reference back and basically it came from elaine doing kind of like an opinion poll or just asking the general public of um do do they have a reptile and then do you still have that reptile oh. now when majority of them said no it was put down as 75% of animals die with it. It was something like that. 75% of animals die within the first year of ownership when really it could have meant anything. Like it could have meant that they'd given the animals away. They sold the animals on. They just didn't have the animals anymore. You know, different people. Well, I think this is some the thing about some of the, the research and evidence is if you, you're, I'm going to use the word intelligence and I don't mean it in a I strong sense. Mean. Yeah. But you can word something to benefit the outcome and, and yes. you know and yes. you, what you said with facebook with people that, that put things on there it's to an audience even if you ask people in the public and you got them to give you one of two answers those answers could both effectively be the same answer and you could draw a conclusion based off uh, a false question yeah, it's called manipulation. Uh, it's question manipulation, answer manipulation. All of these things exist in statistical analysis as um, co-found variable factors and, and, and influences. In good scientific research, in a good article, it will mention that that, that is a potential for the reasoning of the results. Um, there's a lot of things, a lot of... Um, <sighs> I'm trying to think of the word. I can't think of the word. There's a lot of things that are put in place to kind of stop that from happening, if you know what I mean. Uh, one of those, obviously, is inferential statistics, um, which is, don't get me wrong, it's a pain, and it's a horrible word to say because I'm thinking, you know, it brings back flashbacks, and I can't stand statistics. But it's a good way of kind of getting rid of the bias and making sure that your research is actually worth it. A lot of the times research isn't, to be honest. A lot of the times they don't get the p-value that they really want, which means that um, the results are not statistically significant. But it doesn't mean that the research is, is useless. It just means that this time the results were not statist statistically significant. Um, but we, we, we try and, uh, in science, when, when you have a hypothesis, you, you are not trying to prove your hypothesis right. You are trying to prove it wrong. And that's that's the whole point of science in general. So it's, it's an issue that I have with a lot of um, uh, Warwick's work is he tries to prove his hypothesis right, which is really bad science. So you have your null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis to make sure that you're not trying to to, to cherry pick your results. No, um, I think I think if you, to make it 
make it easier for when people listen to you know listen listen back to this. If you put it into current statistics on things that people are up to date with and, and really focusing on, which is the COVID situation. There's been on at this point now fifteen million tests or so carried out. Now I know somebody that's had a test three times. So if that was everybody, that then fifteen million tests doesn't represent in which is in the scale of things, fifteen million people. Yeah. It's just 15 million individual tests. Yeah, yeah. but it's the same, like Sean, because he's a part of the vaccine trial. He's had to have a COVID test every week for the past 12 weeks or something. And well, he's still a statistic. He, yeah, he will still have to continue for 15 months. So he will be having a, a COVID test every week for 15 months. So all of those will result in a hopefully a negative test. Um but yeah, that's what happens. Or some some people it just buggers up and they don't get the risk. It's the problem when you're dealing with large amounts of numbers, um, and that's why you have statistical significance and inferential statistics because it it cuts out all of the confounding variables that may have influenced it incorrectly. But people in general don't understand statistics anyway, um, and a lot of the times the media will cherry pick certain things and have that as an article but you always have to go back to the original scientific source because you'll find out that nine times out of ten it doesn't it doesn't say that at all they've just made that assumption it makes a headline exactly it's it's things so even if we take like examples of vaccines the flu vaccine um how many times have you heard somebody say, oh, I had the flu vaccine and then it gave me flu or I had flu the worst that I've ever had that year when I've had the vaccine? And then they kind of associate it with a negative experience and then they say, well, vaccines don't work or they're useless or I'm not going to have them again. When in reality, nobody has ever said that the flu vaccine is 100% effective. It's 40 to 60% effective depending on the person who's having it, whether they're immunocompromised, blah, blah, blah. They could have already had the flu before they had the vaccine. So it could have been incubating in their body. Then they had the vaccine and then the, the flu came out. Or it might not have even been the flu, unless you have a, a test that determines and says, yes, you have influenza A, B, C or something. And you don't actually know whether you've had the flu. And to be honest, I think that's a natural human reaction. I mean, I know two people. I mean, this is a little bit graphic, so I do apologise in advance. Two people that have had um, a vasectomy. Now, one person's didn't go necessarily well and still to this day gets pains. And I'm not going to name names, obviously. Um, but on the basis of that, I would never have a vasectomy. But that's 50% of the people in which I know that have had that procedure. Well, exactly. The population. But I've made my. That's the point with statistics. So you can put down as an article title now, 50% of people regret vasectomy when really the, the that's why you should always look at the sample size because your sample size is two. Now, yeah. my sample size is one, uh, is Sean, and he had a very bad experience with his vasectomy. But Okay, so that's, that's two to one for me now then. Well, the thing is, is would you recommend a vasectomy, Sean? Yeah. Absolutely, he says. 100% completely would, would recommend having a vasectomy done, uh, even though his went wrong. But in my control, in my, my, my study sample now, which is of one, 100% of people had pains or, or had a bad experience with a vasectomy. So it's, it's just a way that we can manipulate numbers. Um, and that's why inferential statistics, are, you have to be you have to understand the science behind it you have to know what you're looking for do you know what i mean and we can't expect everyone to know and that's why um a lot of warwick's work gets uh, uh gets reviewed gets looked at gets put in the headlines and and put forward because it's catchy and anything to do with human health that will negatively impact you automatically gets people's attention so it's they know that and they know how to play on that nobody cares like if there was if i there was two two studies that came out one of them says you know owning a gecko gives you cancer and the other one was owning a gecko no health issues 
no one's going to give it, no one cares really that there's no impact. They'll care more the fact that this one study says it, owning a gecko causes cancer, when in reality it's, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Just just to put that out there, there is that I made that up. There's no association with cancer <laughs> in geckos. Well, that's that's the old lies, damn lies and statistics, isn't it? It is, yeah. And it's annoying, but it happens. I sometimes get fooled. Um, just for two seconds, I don't know whether Becky can hear us. Can Becky come on the mic? Because I'm not sure whether it's her mic or whether it's just the, oh, the can Skype you system. Can you hear me? Yep. Dan, can you hear me? Yeah, just about, yeah. Okay, I've got a really quick question. Um, the AAL that you mentioned earlier, do yeah. you feel like there is a skew in the regulations actually to protect the humans more so than the animals? There always will be. Does that bother you? Um, <sighs> yes and no. I think I'm used to it now. Um, you'll never get something that protects animals 100 percent you, you can't it's physically impossible but also it would be massively hypocritical considering that we eat a ton of meat and the biggest welfare issues are with animal agriculture and i say this as somebody who un well willingly but sadly does participate in eating meat I personally know that, that, that it's, it's, it's not right. I shouldn't do it. It, it. it shouldn't fit in with my ethics. And I do it for a completely selfish reason. It's because I enjoy it. And that's not a justifiable um, answer in, in, in any terms it, with utilitarianism or with animal rights. But how hypocritical would it be if we protected animals from being handled by people on, on, on encounters and we allowed the, the literal slaughter of billions a year? So it's very difficult to get things right uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a balance. And when you're looking at legislation, the government will always have working groups give uh, and stakeholders so they get opinions from from people and they will always take the business side um, into consideration um, as well as the animal welfare side, because obviously the business side is what pays the taxes, which what keeps the country running. So they have to have a, a give and take in that sense. So it will never just be about the animals at all. And it, it can't if we if we're honest, if we want it to be successful and if we want people to get behind animal welfare, uh, it can't just be about the animals, which is, is sad, but it's it's the truth, really, isn't it? I suppose it, it is. It's that like balance, isn't it, between the two? Yeah. It's it will it will never be perfect, but nothing. Well, will. I think you've highlighted about you know, well, a million flaws with with everything we even ended up on vasectomies and all sorts because of that. Well, yeah, that's generally what our conversations go like, isn't it? Um, anything else from Mike or Jem before I um, Becky? Sorry, I've done it again. Anything else from Mike or Becky before I wrap up? Nothing from me, no. I think we're uh, well covered there. Nothing from me either. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank Are you me. laughing, Becky? Yeah, because I was going to ask Jen if she could send me the information for Deed Paul so I can change my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, I can do. <laughs> for, for anyone that happens to listen after this, I changed my name by Deed Paul in 2016 to Lady Jennifer, so... It is oh, my, I was tell it is my name. <laughs> well, can I just say Lady Jennifer? Yes. That that was um in depth. That wasn't in depth, my friend. <laughs> well, to, to be honest, I mean I, I'm su I'm supposed you could go deeper if you wanted to. Oh it goes but... the rabbit hole goes well beyond there and that's why it made me cry a lot when I first started the masters. <laughs> Getting your head around it is it's hard. It's really hard. No, I'm sure I'm sure you could take it deeper for us. Um Oh I, I definitely could, yes. But
Is that it though? I think we've lost Matt. I think Matt might be laughing. Hello? No, I just want to say thank you for... Oh, come in. Oh, God, you're inviting me, Matt. Uh, <laughs> Becky, can you finish off for me, please? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear, we've lost Matt. Okay. Shall, I, shall I jump in and cover while Matt's um, suffering his hysterical breakdown there? He's incapacitated at the moment. I'm, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. I'm sorry. Are, are we still recording? Yes, we are. So, are you finishing off, Matt, or am I? Yeah, we'll finish off. <laughs> come on, then. Apologies. Oh, this first one back in two months. It's been uh, been emotional. Uh, September's talk has been fantastic, Jen, and hopefully we can uh, get it in person at some point. Yeah, I'll, I can happily do one on kind of like animal rights and um, the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. I think that would be an interesting one for people to understand. Yeah. And to be honest, we, we can always, you're on the committee, so it wouldn't take much for us to, to book you in again, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, next month's talk will be, again, uh, another one of our committee members, which is Rebecca, on Amazon tree boas and their genetics. She's been doing a lot of research over the last 10 years and speaking to various people, so I'm sure that'll be another in-depth talk. Um And then there's just the November talk. One thing we will do is if we can all get out for Christmas um, with the members and stuff like we did last year, we will. But at the moment, we're not going to look at booking anything up or making any any promises because we just don't know how this COVID situation over the next four to five months is going to go. And that's reality. We just have to play it by ear and hope that come January... We're good to rock and roll as as we were. So thank you, thank you, Lady Jennifer, for your time. You're welcome.